Let's stand, church. King of my heart. Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the King of my heart be the shadow where I Ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. And you are good, good, oh, and you are good, good, oh, and you are good, good, oh, and you are good. Well, welcome to church. Welcome to Clondorf Beach Baptist Church. Those online, welcome. And those here, uh, this morning is a great day. Put your hand up if you put that heater on this morning. I am very guilty. It was cool. It was cold. All right. We are going to sing and introduce to you a new song. Uh, this song has really spoken to me over this, this last uh, three months. And it's, um, you know, the words are, God, I look to you. I won't be overwhelmed. There's a lot going on that we can easily be overwhelmed at the moment. And it says, give me vision to see things like you do. God, I look to you. You're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom. You know just what to do. So, team, let's sing this song. God, I look to you. Amen. 
God, I look to you and I won't be overwhelmed. Give me vision to see things like you do. God, I look to you. You know where my help comes from. Give me wisdom. You know just what to do.
And we thank you, Lord, for you are a trustworthy God, for you are King of kings and Lord of lords. And all the people said, Amen. Please be seated. Thank you, Pastor Andrew, who will bring us our announcements. Well, good morning to everyone in the room and to everyone online. It's great to see you here. It is, uh, well, we're pretending that it's cold here for the sake of our Victorian brothers and sisters <laughs> who may be watching online. Uh, we've got no virus here. We've got no lockdown here. And if they really knew what the weather was like here, uh, they may all move here. So just pretend that it's cold uh, with me. I'm joking. That's good. Um, the COVID-19 rules are still in place here, as severe as they are. Um, we must sign in. We've got to stay socially distanced and all of those things, which also means that there's no offering being collected. There's no bulletins to give out. All of that is all to do with the COVID restrictions. Uh, hopefully, well, who knows when it will change? Nobody knows. Uh, there will be a, well, there is a prayer meeting on at the Deception Bay Church on Thursday night. Ordinarily, we would be having a church prayer meeting on Wednesday night. I think it's best if we shut that down and invite ourselves along to the combined church's prayer meeting at Deception Bay on Thursday night at 7.30. Thursday night at 7.30. No prayer meeting here Wednesday night. Instead, save up your energy and go to the debate prayer meeting at 7.30 on Thursday night. Uh, at the conclusion of our service, when we shut the streaming off, there will be uh, a short sending. Uh, so don't rush off when you feel like the service is ending. It's actually, in a sense, only beginning. There is also uh, a members meeting on after the service. I reckon maybe 11, 11.15 11 will be kicking off. Uh, there is also today a huge opportunity to buy a mystery box of morning tea. I said that incorrectly, not buy. Make a donation and take a mystery box of morning tea. The Sunday school, it's not called Sunday school, is it? Kids Church, we call it whatever we like. The Rabble are producing um, morning tea for us. They're actually raising money to help them sponsor. They sponsor a sponsor kid overseas, and they're raising money for that. And so it's a morning tea. You'll find that there's boxes that you can make a donation and take, and they're wrapped in uh, special. Some of them, it's, it's art that the children themselves have done, and there's also Bible verses on there to encourage you. So don't just go, hey, what's this wrapper and chuck it. It's, it's, it's art that the kids have coloured in. It's going to be, they're great. Plus, there's morning tea inside uh, that you can then eat. There's a few gluten-free things, but most of it's just all sugar and chocolate, that kind of stuff. Uh, I think that's clear. They'll be available at tables outside. Uh, so when the service ends and then there's that extra bit of the service and then after that, uh, if you go outside, you'll be able to get from tables there these boxes of morning tea. You just make a donation. Uh, it r really is an honour system there. Uh, some sadder news. Uh, Noel Gostolo. Uh, Karen Flegg's father passed away this morning. Don't know any details. I just know that that's what's happened. So we'll pray in just a minute. And I think that's all I have. So let's pray. Lord, it is exciting to be here. It is great to share in fellowship. It is great to know that you are over us all and that each of us, whatever we've done, wherever we've come from, all because of what you've done, we are connected with you and also therefore with each other. Thank you for the privilege of knowing you and we pray that this day 
you would be especially real to us. Pray particularly for Karen and the rest of the family and ask that you'd be with them in these difficult hours for them. Lord, thank you for Noel and his life. Lord, we do want to also pray for our Sunday school, what a blessing it is to have young people learning about you and we pray for the Sunday school and ask that you bless them and bless uh, their their efforts in raising funds and also too in feeding us. Lord we thank you for them and especially for those who teach there. Lord we thank you for this day and we pray for PJ as he will share with us a bit later. Lord we thank you in Jesus name. Amen. Well, I'm done with announcements. I will advise that the children may now go out for Kids Church. For those of you who may or may not know, um, I'm the worship coordinator here. My name is Jelen. I think I introduced myself before. I'm about to uh, put the call out to my team for their dates to put a new roster together. And you know what? It's getting tough. And I'm sure there's people out there that are gifted who are hiding and I need to know who you are. Please come and introduce yourself to me if you'd like to come and sing or play an instrument and you're happy to have a little audition and just, you know, let me know who you are. I'd really like to to meet you. Um, anyway, team, thank you. Um, this, this next song, it's called Jesus Paid It All and back in Jesus' time, there was um, a thing that they would say when, when the job was completed or, or a task was done or a debt was paid, they would say this word, and I believe it's Aramaic, and, it's, and I don't know if I'm going to pronounce it correctly, tetaleste, tetaleste, that was a word that they would say if they had come home and the job was done, they would say tetaleste. Um, my father actually, he would say, Ecco fatto, he's Sicilian, and he would say, um, It's done, you know. But in Jesus' time, they would say, Tetaleste, it's done, or the debt is paid, or it's finished. And that was the word that Jesus cried out in his last breath Tetaleste is finished, the debt is paid, because Jesus paid our debt, didn't he? And this hymn, this is a revised version of this old hymn, Jesus Paid It All, and it is an incredible reminder of just what Jesus did for us. So let's stand and, and sing this gorgeous song. I hear the Saviour say Thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and pray, find in me thine all in all, cause Jesus paid it all.
Perfect love casts out all fear. We no longer need to be slaves of fear, Lord, because your love is perfect. And we thank you, Lord. We pray that we would now have ears that hear and a heart that is willing to listen to your words spoken through Pastor PJ now. Lord, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, I was on mute. Good morning, everyone. Everyone here and everyone at home. Um, good morning. Um, it's, it's another beautiful day to, to worship God and, of course, to, to get to know Him better through His Word. It's a bit cold, and I forgot my jacket, so bear with me. <laughs> um, yeah, I grew up in the tropics, so some people say this isn't bad, but for me, this is freezing, so... <laughs> All right, so for our message this morning, um, I believe God has led me to talk about something in our Christian lives that sometimes we uh, overlook, well, at least compared to other aspects of our walk with Jesus. So what I'm referring to is God's desire for us to live out repentance before Him and other people in our daily lives because we are children of God. So normally when repentance is talked about in church or in our Bible studies, it refers to repentance towards salvation, which of course is very, very important because overall, repentance from all our sin and our old way of life, it goes hand in hand and cannot be separated from our faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. So like, like no, one, no one can say that they trust in Jesus or that they have faith in Christ if they don't even believe in what Jesus is saying, that we are all hopeless sinners who are guilty before God, and so we are in dire need of His grace and His rescue. That's why we need a Savior. Thus, I believe in Jesus, um, our belief in Jesus or our trust in Him. And what He says about us and our overall need to repent or to turn away from our sins, these go together along with faith, and it cannot be just one or the other. So faith and repentance always go together. They are intrinsically linked and are essential ingredients of salvation. And once we are saved by grace, therefore, so just as Jesus expects us to live by faith or that we live out our daily lives trusting in how Jesus says we should live, Jesus also expects us to live out or demonstrate our repentance before Him and others through our attitudes, our words, and actions. So not, 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 not that works are a requirement of salvation, of course not. Salvation is by grace through faith alone. And genuine faith in Jesus is always accompanied by a repentant heart, as mentioned earlier. But as it says in James 226, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Meaning genuine faith, if your faith in Jesus is real, it will come out in the way that you think, in the way that you speak and act. Well, at least most of the times as, as Christian. And if it doesn't, then I guess we need to really look at our relationship with God. If, if a life of faith is not coming out, why is that? We need to talk to God about that. And of course, the same is also true about repentance. That if we are truly repentant of our sins before God, then we should also bear fruits of repentance. Or as the Apostle Paul says, we should demonstrate our repentance by our deeds. So that is what God expects of us as Christians. 
as people who have surrendered our lives to Jesus and who have received salvation, then our genuine faith and repentance should come out in the way that we live our daily lives. So Matthew um, 3, 8 and Acts 26, 20 are two of our main verses for today. Before I read them and the context to those verses, let me just open with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you again for the privilege to get to know you better through your word. Thank you that you are teaching us uh, how you expect us to live, how you want us to live as your children. Thank you for the salvation that we already have because of what you've done for us. You died on the cross to pay for our sins, and now we have eternal life in you. Help us to live um, as you want us to live, as your children. We commit ourselves to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So let me first read Matthew chapter 3, verses 4 to 8. So that would give us a better context of Matthew 3, 8. Let me try and put that up on screen. There you go. Matthew chapter 3 from verse 4. It says here, I'm reading from the NIV. It says, John's clothes. So this is John the Baptist being described here. It says, John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Verse 6, confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. So that is one of our main verses for today, Matthew 3, 8. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. So as we can see from Matthew, it's not enough to be just a... Uh, to be just a zealously religious person because the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were sad, you see? Oh, I just popped it in my mind. No, they, they were very religious people. They were very religious. They did all their religious tasks and deeds. They were even experts in the law. At least some of them were very good. Um, they knew God's words law probably um, like the back of their hand. They could, some, most of them could recite it verbatim. And they even tried to comply with all of its requirements. So outwardly, they seem to be very godly and religious people. So let's say, if they were people, people like living nowadays, maybe it's hard to relate with them, but if they were people uh, living nowadays, they would probably be people who were always at church, people who knew a lot of scripture, people who who always gave their offering. They always did church stuff. So outwardly, they would be doing very good things. And and that's great. Those things are good. Those things aren't bad at all. They're great. But then why is it here? It says, but John said to them, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the coming wrath. Produce faith in keeping with repentance. Why did John say that? And and why to these people? They seem to be, you know, this was a big crowd there. So there seemed to be, well, at least in my mind, there would have been a lot worse sinners than them in that crowd. So why them? Why did John call them out? So John was calling out these Pharisees and Sadducees because they thought that their religiosity made them right with God. They thought that they knew better than others because of their religious zeal and practices. But outward religious piety doesn't always equate to a repentant heart or a heart that humbles itself before God. See, a person with a repentant heart is a person that says to God, God, you're right. I'm, I'm a person who, who has rebelled against you, or sometimes still rebels against you, and I'm wrong. And so I now want to do things your way, under your authority, and I no longer want to live according to just my own human ways or my personal way of understanding and doing things. So one main way that a genuine repentant heart is demonstrated in daily life is through humility before God. We humble ourselves before God and also before other people, especially those whom God has sent. So let me read some verses from Matthew chapter 23 to better illustrate what I mean. So Matthew 23. So I suggest if you have time, uh, maybe later on, that you read the whole of Matthew 23. But for now, let me just look at some verses that show us 
um, some aspects of true repentance that causes people to be humble before God and to those whom God has sent. So Jesus is speaking here. I'll read starting from verse 23 of chapter 23. And he says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees. So it's the it's, it's same crowd, or at least a similar crowd. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Oh, I lost my place. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin. So they, they tithe religiously. But you have neglected the more important matters of the law justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You have practiced the latter. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. Verse 24, you blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. So these people think they know what is right, or they claim that they know what is right, and, and so they even try and persuade or guide others into their blind thinking. They become blind guides. And they make trivial things, big issues. They, they, you know, they strain out a gnat. They focus on superficial things, on, on, on things that are not really important to God, while ignoring more important matters, like their own sin and other people's sin. You know, they, they let bad behavior slide. They swallow that camel hole. Why do they do that? So, so let's, let's read on. Let's read on. Verse 25. It says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. So we see in verse 25, greed or personal gain and self-indulgence. Self-indulgence, getting what they want, their preferences, their own desires, is what motivates unrepentant people. They focus on little things to try and sway people to think that they know what they are saying, all the while ignoring their own mistakes or the mistakes of the people who are willing to agree with them. These, you know, these Pharisees, they're like, well, nowadays, like maybe bad politicians who use issues to push their own agendas rather than God's will. They try to make themselves look good outwardly, but all they want is to get whatever they want motivated by self-indulgence. Verse 26, Jesus says, Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside also will be clean. So verse 26 tells us that real change starts from the heart and is expressed later on through outward action. Again, a demonstration of repentance. Let's jump a few verses forward. In verse 33, Jesus says, You snakes, you brood of vipers. That is exactly the same description John the Baptist used earlier in Matthew 3, 8 to describe those who needed to produce fruits in keeping with repentance. Jesus asked this crowd, How will you escape being condemned to hell? And then verse 34, Therefore, so here the Bible tells us what God did for such people, those unrepentant people. What did God do? He said, I am sending you prophets and sages and teachers. But sadly, what did, what, what did the unrepentant people do? It says there, uh, again, these people refused to submit to God himself, and they opposed the people whom God has sent. It says, some of them you will kill and crucify, others you will flog in your synagogues and pursue from town to town. So as we can see, people with unrepentant hearts, they rebel, they persecute, they do not believe in God's appointed messengers. So are we like that? Are, are we people who distrust the authority that God has placed over us? Like when someone speaks the truth from Scripture, from the Word, we refuse to believe because oh, it's not, I don't think that's, that's what the Bible is saying. I don't think, do we persecute God's messengers? Or it doesn't have to be uh, pastors or church leaders. You know, some, some, some of our Christian friends will help us to know the truth and they will help us to see what God is saying. But sometimes we persecute them for trying to help us to know God's will. Do we think that we know better than people that God has sent to us? And so we flog them. In our minds, we crucify them as criminals. People keep looking for gnats, small issues to make big or focus on Again, while all the while ignoring 
the message that God is already speaking to us. God speaks to us through his servants whom he sends. They bear the authority of God himself. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often have I longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Jesus wants us to turn to him, to trust in him by heeding the warning and the message that he is giving us through himself and the people that he has sent. So we have to ask ourselves, am I willing to repent enough to let myself be under God's wings, under God's authority, or do I want to keep doing things my way, the, the way that I think is best or what is right? A true repentant person has a humble heart, especially before God and those whom he has sent, and all other people as well. And again, it can't just be an intellectual humility or an agreement in thought or principle. Yes, it starts with that, but genuine repentance always comes out through an actual change in deeds or action. Uh, let's take the life of the Apostle Paul as an example. I'm jumping over to Acts 26. So in Acts 26, while on trial before Festus, the Apostle Paul shares the story of his salvation. But also, indirectly, God shows us what repentance in action looks like through the Apostle Paul's life. So let me read Acts 26 from verses 12 to 23. So Paul is speaking here from verse 12. So it says, On one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. So that means Paul was going around arresting everyone who proclaimed that Jesus is the Messiah and that he rose from the grave because Paul thought he knew better than them. He was a Pharisee after all. Remember those unrepentant people uh, who we talked about earlier. So, and then in the next, Paul continues his story in verse 13. About noon, King Agrippa, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Verse 15, then I asked, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. The Lord replied, now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant as a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I'm sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Now let's see how Paul responded. Verse 19. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven, first to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and then to the Gentiles. I preached that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. Again, our, our main point for today. Genuine repentance is demonstrated by action. So what kind of action? Let's have a look later on. Verse 21. That is why some Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. So we again see here, so what, what do unrepentant people do? People who refuse to submit to the authority of God, to, who refuse his message? It says here, again, like what Jesus had said earlier, they persecute or go against God's chosen messengers. Even if that messenger was once their close ally, like Saul of Tarsus, a famous Pharisee, who then became the Apostle Paul. These people are not just opposing Paul, the messenger, the people are opposing God himself and what he is saying through Paul. So next, verse 22. But God helped me to this very day, so I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I'm saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen. 
that the Messiah would suffer as the first to rise from the dead, would bring the message of light to his own people and to the Gentiles. So how did Paul demonstrate his repentance? Overall, Paul obeyed Jesus. He obeyed Jesus. Remember we, we read a few verses earlier in verses 17, 17 to 18 that Paul was sent by God to both Jews and Gentiles to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light. So Paul was commanded by God to share Jesus with others. And Paul obeyed this. So we see that from verse 22. It says, Paul obeyed by actually testifying or telling everyone the message of Jesus. And also, as he was doing that, he was admitting that he was once wrong. And that his message now about Jesus is the real good news that comes from God. You see, indirectly, Paul was contradicting himself. You know what he was saying and, and teaching before? We know that he repented of that because he was now willing to admit that he was wrong. And he was vocal about it. He didn't make excuses and say, oh, but I was misled by you know, my, my Jewish upbringing and my culture, or it was my synagogue teachers that taught me the wrong things, or that my friends, you know, they're very good Jews and they didn't believe in Jesus or his disciples, so I believe my friends, that's why I did what I did. No, Paul made no excuses and he owned up to his mistakes. Paul admitted to the people that he was wrong by now declaring to them a message that is completely opposite of what he had believed and proclaimed before. He did a 180 degree turnaround. So not 360, that will be all the way around. So Paul did not try and hide his mistakes. He admitted it to everyone. He agreed with Jesus that he was a person who opposed God, that he made wrong choices. You know, in 1 Timothy 1.15, Paul even calls himself the worst sinner of all. And, and now, Paul is unashamed to tell everyone something that is completely opposite of what he was saying before. Because he was truly repentant. Paul repented, and so his words and actions changed. His words and actions changed. Paul now agreed with and supported the people he once opposed. The people that he was once vehemently opposing, the Christians, Paul now cared for them. He agreed with them, and he even supported them. And he openly let others know about it. Even at great sacrifice, you know, with his life and reputation at stake, Paul obeyed God because he had a truly repentant heart. There was a change in words and action. You see, genuine repentance takes away the shame of admitting mistakes and even asking for an apology. And it moves us further to do the right thing. Paul could have simply believed in Jesus and you know, asked for Jesus' forgiveness, and then he, he could have kept a low profile. Ooh, maybe he could have waited a long time and let people forget about his mistakes, who he was, before he started sharing Jesus' truth with others. But no, we read, we, we read what Paul did. Paul said he immediately went into Damascus and he started to positively talk about Jesus. You know, Jesus was once a negative thing for Paul. When Paul immediately went to Damascus and Jesus was now a positive thing. He changed what he was saying. Paul could have tried to hide his identity, maybe even doing that. Maybe, oh, I'm not Paul. But no, Paul admitted his mistakes. He made everyone know that he was wrong before. And that he has now surrendered to Jesus. We too, if we are truly repentant, we should make the effort to admit our mistakes first before God, first and foremost before God, and then to all those who were directly affected by our wrongdoing, and later even possibly people who have been, who have been made aware of our past mistakes. So that is one of the ways, that is one of the ways that living out or demonstrating repentance looks like. There is an actual change in words and actions. So again, let's see. Repentance demonstrated in our actions involves some of these things. It involves agreeing with God. That we are people who oppose God. We have to admit that. 
people as sinners. We are people who have once opposed God completely. And even as sinners, from the, I, I mean, as Christians, even as Christians who are saved and redeemed by God, who have eternal life, sometimes we do still oppose God. We still want to do things our way from time to time. And repentance demonstrated involves agreeing with God so that when we find a conflict between our ways and God's ways, we should always agree that God's ways are right. It is God's ways, not what I want, not what I think. It's God's ways that are right. And whatever my human ways, thoughts, or feelings say, if they are in conflict with God, they are wrong. No excuses. No excuses that, oh, you know, I'm just a human. I, I fall in. No, they're wrong. We just go before God, no excuses. We agree with Him. And demonstrating repentance involves humility. So considering God's authority over us as supreme, and also humility before other people. Thinking of others or considering others more highly than ourselves, especially, as we read, especially God's servants, God's chosen people who, has, who He has appointed over us. Next, it involves admission of guilt. Again, these are demonstrations, demonstrations of repentance. It involves admission of guilt. To those who we have wronged, we go to them. We apologize. We admit our mistakes. If we have wronged someone, made mistakes, we need to apologize. Also, um, if our past mistakes were like public things, we may need to also make a public apology. If our past mistakes are public knowledge, then we need to make others aware that we are apologetic as well. Remember how in the Bible, um, people even put on sackcloth and ashes as a public expression of their repentance and mourning over their sin? So it's a good thing if it's genuine. Again, some, some people did that in the past. Um, again, not from their heart. But if it's a genuine thing that we do, a similar out, outward sign of our repentance, we probably won't do that today, but a similar outward sign of repentance can help us even today. You know, just to show that if we've made a mistake, we want others to know that I, I admit that I'm wrong and I want to follow God now moving forward. And of course, repentance causes us to be obedient to Jesus. Because, we've already mentioned, repentance involves agreeing that whatever God says, that is always right. Thus, His will is now what we would want to do moving forward, no longer our own. This is why genuine repentance always results in obedience, because we agree with God. And, and in, in, in every case, in every case, complete obedience to Jesus involves telling others of who Jesus is and what He has done for us, just as Paul did. So a repentant heart also moves us to obedience, to actually doing what God says we should do. And again, that involves making disciples, telling others of who Jesus is and what He has done for us. Now also, in most cases, unless it is physically impossible, obedience to Jesus as a fruit of repentance also involves making amends or even compensating those whom, whom we may have harmed. Remember Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus, the tax collector, the little guy? Yeah, he's popular in Sunday school. Yeah, I think there's a song, I forgot, but Zacchaeus, the tax collector, when he believed in Jesus, this is what he did. So let me re read Luke 19, 5 to 9. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said, so Zacchaeus climbed a sycamore tree. So when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to, the guest of a, uh, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. Verse 8, But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Verse 9, Jesus said to him, Today, Salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. So that means a, that's a person who has faith in God just like Abraham is considered to be a person uh, or um, a descendant of Abraham. 
not literally, but spiritually. You may have not, yeah, you may have noticed. So even when people started to whisper about Zacchaeus in the background, they were talking about Jesus, but they were also implying that Zacchaeus is a cheater. Was Zacchaeus ashamed to admit that? No, Zacchaeus wasn't ashamed to admit to everyone that he cheated people as a tax collector. And furthermore, he was now willing to give, even sacrificially, and even compensate generously those he had wronged. That is what genuine repentance in Christ does to people. It makes us generous and even unworried or not so worried of our own circumstances or what others may think of us. Repentance makes us think of the welfare of others more than ourselves because we have found our rest and satisfaction in Jesus. So today, if you need to repent before God and other people, then start by talking to God about it. Start with prayer. You know, admit to God your mistakes in prayer and ask Jesus if you have, maybe you have sins that you are unaware of or have not repented of yet. Even as Christians, we all have those blind spots in our lives. That is, we, we don't always see our own mistakes. Sometimes we get confused or blinded by opinions or the things of the world. Of course, we shouldn't stress about trying to figure out all of the sins in our life on our own. You know, that can cause anxiety in us. The Holy Spirit will eventually convict us of all our sins. That's one of the works of the Holy Spirit. It brings conviction to us if we do sin. But we can ask God proactively to reveal our sins to us. We can actually pray for that, to ask God, God, if there's anything I need to repent of, anything that I need to confess, then help me to be aware of it so that I can do it. And of course, we need to ask God to guide us and then empower us to be able to overcome whatever specific sin God is asking us to repent of. So even King David himself, a person described by the Bible to be a man after God's own heart, he recognized his tendency to sin and to not be aware of his mistakes. So in Psalm 138, 23 to 24, David said, Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. David asked God to reveal his sins to him so that David could repent. And David also asked for God's help so that he can do what is necessary to demonstrate repentance. As David said, lead me in the way everlasting. Teach me what to do, God, moving forward. So today, let's not resist God. If God is asking us to repent, then we should agree with him. We should admit our mistakes. And then we should demonstrate our repentance by actually doing what God is asking us to do. It should come out through words and actions, a change in words and actions, a change in what we say and do. If it's not too clear yet, again, then start praying about it. Maybe God is asking you to speak to someone. Maybe God is asking you to change your mind about something that you're doing or maybe it's something that you are not doing and God is asking you, my child, start doing this. Maybe you need to start talking about me with your friends, with your family. Maybe God is even asking you to make an apology. Maybe God is asking you to say sorry to someone, even a public apology if necessary. Or maybe he's asking you to compensate someone you have harmed. Again, genuine repentance before God and other people is demonstrated through action, through deeds. There must be something that would happen, that would come out. I understand it can be difficult to do. Sometimes it's even difficult to just know what to do. But don't worry. God himself will help us achieve what he is asking us to do if we are willing to repent. So I'll end, I'll, end, I'll end here in 1 John 1, 8 and 9, which says, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just, and will forgive our sins 
and purify us from all unrighteousness. So when the Bible says that God will purify us from all unrighteousness, that also involves helping us or empowering us to do the right thing moving forward. That part of purification means He will help us to do the right thing. It may not always be easy, but as gold is purified by fire, God too will enable us to do His good will if we are willing to repent and trust in Him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you once more for your word. Thank you for reminding us that you want us to live out both our faith and our repentance in you. We recognize, Lord Jesus, that even as Christians, sometimes we make mistakes. We recognize that sometimes we still oppose you, Lord, and in the things that you teach us and you tell us. We want to know, Lord Jesus, how you want us to move, how you want us to live our lives moving forward. We admit that we are people who make mistakes and who oppose you, but we thank you that you have paid for all our sins. You died on the cross and rose from the grave to assure us that we have forgiveness and that we have eternal life. Help us now, Lord Jesus, to live a life of repentance in humility and in, hu in, in obedience of you every day. Change the way we think, the way we speak, and the way we act. May it be all according to your will. We commit ourselves to you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing this final song.
Lord, shine your light into our hearts and see if there be any wicked way in us. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to walk in the ways everlasting. Help us to be people with repentant hearts. And we pray that you would go with us this week, enabling us to be and to do all that you would have us to be and to do. Lord, we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, please be seated here in the room, and I'm going to say goodbye to everyone online. God's blessing to you all.